Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fourth installment of our five-part Workforce Wednesday briefing mini-series set for the month of September. It seems like only yesterday that we were looking at high school programs, conservation corps, and Western coal country. Actually, it was just last week. And if you've missed anything so far, visit us online at www.esi.org to review the full slate of briefings to date and sign up for future updates. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And as I approach my first anniversary on the job, I've learned a lot, of course. Some things were expected and some not so much. For instance, something maybe I did not anticipate, it has been made to me, made very clear to me, convincingly and unequivocally, that everybody loves mass timber. And that is a good thing because today's briefing is all about growing green industry and innovation mass timber. It literally, I'm not joking, it seems that people have been crawling out of the woodwork, pun intended, to talk with me about mass timber over the last few weeks. People love it, absolutely love it. And if not for all the love for Zendaya after the Emmys, I would say that mass timber is the single most compelling and interesting topic of conversation right now. I guess you could add that to her resume. She somehow stole attention away from mass timber. I kid, of course, Zendaya seems like a genuinely nice person and congratulations on her big win. Topical joke. So back to mass timber. What exactly is mass timber? Is it a tree that grows in Dorchester? Is it like how big or how much a poplar weighs? Is it a bunch of willow boughs blowing in the wind in the same direction at rush hour? Well, take it from me, this is an up and coming climate change solution of untapped potential. I'm really looking forward to hearing from our panelists today. And bonus points to anyone on our panel who manages to reference Zendaya's impressive catalog of work and performances. Mass timber is only one issue covered during our Workforce Wednesday briefing mini-series. If you've missed our previous briefings and need to catch up, uh, or if you'd like to learn about the wide range of climate, clean energy, and environmental topics we cover, take a moment to visit us online at www.esi.org. The best way to stay up to date on our briefings is to sign up for our bi-weekly climate change solutions newsletter. Once again this week, we are very fortunate to have a special guest in addition to our panel lineup. It is my privilege to introduce U.S. Representative Bruce Westerman of Arkansas, who is joining us today via video recording. Representative Westerman is not only an engineer, not only an expert, and not only a leader in policy development to encourage the use of mass timber as a climate change and workforce development and forestry and conservation solution. He is also, interestingly, a proud Razorback, a four-year walk-on member at the University of Arkansas and on their football team. I feel like that needs a special call out in this most unusual football season. So we are pleased to have him join us today to help us tackle this important issue. Greetings, I'm Bruce Westerman. I'm an engineer and a forester, and I happen to serve in Congress representing Arkansas's fourth congressional district. I'm excited to be with you today to talk about two of my favorite things, building and wood and not only building in wood, but building with wood. And I've got here in my hand a really innovative uh, product. It's called Cross Laminated Timber. You can see they simply just took two befores, glued them together on the edge, then turned them perpendicular to one another. It's, think of it as a, as a big piece of plywood made out of two befores. And you can go thicker than this. You can make wide panels, long panels. Uh, but there's a lot of benefits using this kind of construction. You can build the panels. Uh, in the factory, ship them out to the job site, lift them in place with a crane. You can see erection happening much quicker on the job site with less labor. Plus, this is a big carbon sink. You know, trees are the natural carbon eater. Through photosynthesis, they breathe in carbon dioxide, give off oxygen for us to breathe, and all that carbon gets stored here uh, in long carbon chains in the wood for as long as this wood remains intact. As a matter of fact, 40 to 50 percent of this wood by weight is carbon. So when we build with renewable, strong material like cross-laminated timber, uh, we are storing a lot of carbon in the building. Wood is also a fantastic insulator. When you get thick pieces of wood like this, fire won't uh, destroy the structural properties quickly enough to, to deplete the fire rating. Um, you got the insulating qualities and plus you got a high weight to strength ratio and it's very elastic so if you're building in a seismic zone this is a great material. 
We've seen this in my home state of Arkansas where the University of Arkansas has built two five-story dormitories out of wood. Uh, Walmart has announced they're going to build their new corporate headquarters, you know, uh, office complex to house 15,000 people. They're building it all out of mass timbers that will be made at a new mass timber facility in Arkansas. I think the future is very bright for mass timber construction, which is also very good for our forest because we need uh, markets so that we can do sustainable management on the forest. So excited that you all are talking about mass timber construction. Wish I was there in person to visit with you, uh, but I wish you well and Godspeed as we rebuild America with mass timber. Great. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Representative Westerman, for joining us today. Uh, we agree. We wish we could be with you in person today as well. And um, on behalf of everyone at ESI and our audience, I uh, really want to thank you for your leadership on these issues. Our best wishes are right back at you. Please be well, uh, stay safe, and take care. Uh, and thanks again for that really excellent presentation. Uh, quick reminder about questions before I introduce our next panelist. If you have a question, we will have a Q&A after our third panelist. You can send it to us via Twitter, at ESI Online. Uh, that's probably the best way. You can also send us an email, eesi at eesi.org, and I can confirm that we're already starting to get some questions. This is a hot topic, and this is going to be a great, a great panel today. Our first panelist is Jennifer Cover. She is a licensed, California licensed professional engineer and president and CEO of Woodworks, a nonprofit program that is a partnership with the U.S. Forest Service. The objective of this program is to make it easier to design, engineer, and construct buildings utilizing innovative wood materials such as mass timber to create a more sustainable built environment. Jennifer's experience includes business development, market analysis, project management, and structured design, all with an emphasis on wood construction. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'll go ahead and jump right in. Um, I have my, my slides up. Are you able to see those? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so mass timber provides workforce benefits really across the entire supply chain from forestry to manufacturing to the architect and engineering work that goes into it all the way to the construction and um, installation side of the business. So there really is across the entire supply chain um, workforce benefits that we can talk to. So as a sustainable natural resource that actually pulls carbon from our atmosphere, the use of wood products have the opportunity to improve our environment and the health of our forests. But the green quality of wood products such as mass timber is not the only benefit to our society. We are here today obviously to discuss the workforce impact of mass timber. Um, and how this can impact our communities throughout the entire country. Uh, Tyler and Carter are gonna be going into uh, much more detail on the manufacturing side. So I won't spend a lot of time here, but I do want to just share a few statistics with you. Um, a recent report was released um, by Forest Economic Advisors, and it highlights the importance of the softwood lumber manufacturing industry on the US economy, and in particular, the health of rural communities. Through both the direct manufacture and via the downstream industries that use softwood lumber as a primary input, FEA estimates that over 775,000 jobs with a total payroll uh, of more than $46 billion are tied to the softwood lumber manufacturing industry. And these jobs uh, found in 515 operating sawmills impact 470 mostly rural communities across 32 different states. So the breadth of this industry is definitely significant um, and so that's why we're excited to be here uh, talking about it today. Now when we talk about workforce education, uh, much of what has to occur in order to grow a market is the education of the specifiers. And the specifiers are the architects, the engineers, and the developers who are calling out what material will be used to build a project. And so this is where Woodworks ends up spending a significant amount of time because we have to grow this market in order for there to be demand for the materials that are used on these jobs. And um, so what we do is we're able to educate about uh, 35,000 practitioner hours is what we um, award annually. 
and we also provide support on 400 building projects um, on an annual basis and we're able to provide the support for no cost. So this is a free service that we offer to the design community to help them successfully design projects. So we try to put sort of this tool in their tool belt. And um, we're able to do this um, in great part to the funding that we receive from the US Forest Service. So we receive this both from state and private um, forestry as well as the research side of the Forest Service through the Forest Products Lab and also through the USDA uh, checkoff program, the Softwood Lumber Board. So those are our two key funders that really allow us to be able to do this to grow the market demand uh, for the products so that the workforce um, you know, is able to kind of pull this whole thing along by having this demand in place. And we're seeing some really great success. So overall, again, we provide support on about 400 projects annually throughout the US for all wood products. But when we just look at mass timber, this map here is showing you where the mass timber projects are throughout the US. And one of the reasons I like this map is that it helps convey the point that this isn't just in one part of the country. So we are really seeing mass timber take off throughout the entire United States. And the excitement's been really cool to watch. Uh, there's been about 384 projects that have been built that utilize mass timber for some portion of their construction. And there's another 537 that are currently in design. So these are projects that we are currently providing support on trying to get them over the finish line utilizing mass timber. So we're looking at about 921 projects that have either been constructed or are currently in design utilizing some form of mass timber throughout the US. Now what Woodworks does often is tries to identify like where are the hurdles. So as we're trying to grow a market, um, we want to better understand what are the things that are standing in the way of projects going forward. And what we found over the last year was that we may have an architect and engineering team that has an owner who's very excited about trying mass timber. We've helped them understand um, all the environmental benefits, all the aesthetic benefits, and they're really excited to try to do their project in mass timber. And we begin working with them. And what we found was that in a lot of cases, these projects would get stopped because of a lack of familiarity on the construction side. So we would sit down with the design team they bring in the general contractor and the general contractor's perspective would be, you know, this is not something I understand. And if you understand construction, you know that um, risk is tied to dollars. And so a lot of times what would happen is that really large contingencies would be tied to the estimate because there's a lot of risk involved trying something new. And so we quickly realized that this was becoming a significant hurdle. We were seeing multiple projects over and over again getting stopped when we had some great momentum going, trying to utilize the material and they would just get halted because the general contractor would prefer to switch back to something they're more familiar with. So we set out to educate this group. So we work with, worked with the uh, US Forest Service and the US Endowment for Forestry to pull together some funding to begin to educate this um, part of the workforce. And as we dove into it, we realized there's really two different groups. There is the construction management workforce, and then there's the installer workforce. And they each have sort of different needs um, in order to be successful. And so our goal here is to really take a group that was um, creating a hurdle to this market moving forward and turn them into champions. And so I've seen some great success so far, and it's been really exciting to watch this happen. So on the construction management side, we are referring to the group that needs education related to how to properly sequence trades, how to estimate the cost, how to figure out how um, the overall project will function and work. And so we created a curriculum uh, for this audience and we've begun doing the education. So um, Woodworks is smart enough to know that, uh, you know, we're structural, a lot of engineers and architects, and we have uh, definitely a few people on our team that come from a construction background, but we're smart enough to know that we need to bring experts in on this. So what we went ahead and did was actually pull folks who have built these buildings together to build our curriculum out. So this isn't theoretical, this isn't you know what we think you should do. We actually have people teaching these workshops um, and help us build the curriculum that we offer who have done these projects. And so I really feel like peer-to-peer -peer training has been very significant uh, for this workforce to, to, again, to help them with the familiarity and the comfort level. So, so far, uh, we started this towards the end of last year, but so far into 2020, 
we held four in-person construction management workshops and we reached 216 participants with that. And since things have been um, pivoted to virtual, we've held two online versions of the construction management workshop and we reached uh, 440 participants with that. So it has been great to see that the interest is there regardless of whether it's in-person or online, even something as hands-on as construction management um, is something that people are still wanting and needing the education on and very interested in participating in it. On the installer side of the workforce, what we realized as we began to evaluate, you know, how can we um, accelerate the knowledge in this field, we decided the best approach here was really to seed the training centers that are ready in place. So across the US, there's a lot of workforce training centers, um, such as carpentry training locations, that are already doing education for this workforce. And so the best way to, to help them was to partner with them and figure out what they need. So we met first with the Chicago Carpenters Training Center, and in discussions with them, it came to light that they needed a mock-up. They needed something that they could actually put together, take apart over and over again in a lot of their um, training sessions. So we got a mock-up created for them and, and um, we had that sent over to them and now they can utilize that in their training. And we also uh, provided feedback on a lot of the content that they were putting together for this training opportunities. So they have already delivered um, over 2,400 education training hours to carpenters through their training center. And then we've just started to begin to work with the Northwest Carpenters Institute. And for that group, we also help procure um, a number of smaller mock-ups and connection details that they can take apart and put together over and over again. Additionally, we have started to reach out to general contractors who would like to either self-perform or help train um, installers um, that might be subs to them. And so from that, one example is HIT Construction. We've begun working with them. So again, the idea is to give them the curriculum and get them out training on their own to really get this workforce developed and to increase the understanding of this material. Now, one of the other things that I realized as we started to look at this is the next gap is, well, how do people find out who's trained? Like, where is the information on this? So what we did was create an online community called the Woodworks Innovation Network. So this is a website that's uh, brand new. We just launched it about a month ago. And the idea here is to help locate people who have been trained in this area. So it includes um, architects and engineers, but it also includes contractors and installers as well. So folks who have gone through any type of training are listed um, in this network and you can find them and search by them. So if you are a developer and you're looking at um, trying to do a mass timber project and you want to find out who potentially regionally could be on your job, who has the knowledge needed, you can go to the WIN website and search on a map by a project, by a, um, a discipline, and be able to find folks that are trained in that area. So the idea here was to really help people that we've trained um, that are, is in, are in these workforces to actually be connected to real jobs and projects and you know, kind of bridge that final gap to make sure that um, if they put in the effort to get trained that there's actually a job that they can be connected to. Um, one of the things that I'm just completing right now is what is called a dead lead study. And the idea here is to look at projects that did not go forward and try to understand why. And one of the things that I found very interesting is still one of the number one reasons that we keep running into um, when I interview people as to, you know, they were thinking about mass timber, they got pretty far down the road, and then it just didn't go forward. And over and over again, I keep hearing that it is really this lack of familiarity at the general contractor and installer level. And it really throws a wrench in these projects moving forward. So, what we're in the process of doing now is developing a three-year uh, program that will include a mass timber construction manual that can be handed out to companies, um, a 16-hour installer training package that'll be like a self-contained education that we can just give out. Um, and everything we do, again, is at no cost, so this isn't um, something we're trying to sell, it's just we're trying to get that education out there. Um, we are going to try to seed another 10 training centers, 10 community colleges we're going to try to do some outreach to to help them get the tools they need to do this education and we're also looking at engaging with about 50 different general contractors and doing workshops ourselves that will either be um, virtual or in person so um, you know, I think another, I'd like to just close the slide that really addresses the market growth opportunity because I think sometimes people are trying to kind of get their hands around well, what are we talking about here how much opportunity is there for work um, in this field and so what I'm showing here is a chart that shows the four building types that Woodworks focuses on um, in terms of providing support and projects to try to convert them to wood construction. And the green is in each of those building types what we already have in wood. 
and the whitish gray is what um, is the opportunity. So this is what is not being currently done in wood, but that by code could be. So you can see commercial institutional, there's large portions of these markets that are not using sustainable wood solutions that could be by code. So the only thing standing in the way is really education and perception. Um, and the seven stories on the right there is obviously the brand new seven plus stories um, is the brand new opportunity that's been uh, brought to the market by the code adjustments that now um, enable and give the guidance to design buildings up to 18 stories using mass timber. So it's a brand new market opportunity uh, for these materials. So overall, we're looking at about 17,000 buildings that are built annually that could use wood products that currently are not, but by code could. And if you think back to the map I showed in the beginning, we're looking at several hundred a year that are being designed with mass timber and that are going to construction. So the difference between several hundred and 17,000, we got a long way to go. So we are really just at the starting line here. Um, yeah, as was mentioned in the introduction, there's a lot of excitement about mass timber. We need to see these get over the finish line into real projects. And that's what Woodworks is focused on and that's what we're trying to do. So thank you for the time and um, happy to answer any questions later on in the, in the meeting. That was a great presentation, Jennifer. Thank you so much for um, helping us kick off today's briefing. Um, our next panelist uh, is Tyler Freres. He is the Vice President of Sales for Freres Lumber, Lumber Company Incorporated. He has worked directly in plywood manufacturing since 2004. As an executive team member, uh, Tyler takes an active role in determining the long-term direction of his company. He's responsible for selling and sourcing all veneer uh, for Freres. And in 2016, Tyler created Freres's Mass Plywood Panel, or MPP. Tyler, welcome today. Uh, really looking forward to your presentation. and. Uh, I, I just want to respect your wood paneling in your office. It's, it seems very appropriate given the industry you're working in. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the uh, invitation to be here and uh, to tell everyone exactly what we do. Uh, my name is Tyler Ferris. I'm vice president at uh, Ferris Lumber Company. Ferris Lumber Company was started in 1922 by my grandfather, T.G. Ferris. Uh, we started as a sawmill on North Fork of the Sanium River in the Sanium River Canyon of, uh, of Oregon. We moved to our current location in the 1950s and converted to mini veneer manufacturing from lumber, from traditional lumber manufacturing. So now we operate two veneer plants, a veneer drying facility in which we merchandise a lot of veneer from, uh, to all the local West Coast manufacturers of uh, engineered wood products. We have our own plywood plant in which we're making commodity grade sheeting products such as walls, roofs, and floors for uh, single family, multifamily construction. Uh, we also make our structural composite lumber material as a raw material for our, our mass ply facility there. Uh, we run a cogeneration co facility in which we create about 7.2 megawatts of electricity. That's enough to power about 5,000 homes in our local community. Uh, we still run a stud mill in which we're creating dimensional lumber out of the leftover core material from our uh, lathe. We also run a fleet of log and highway trucks. And as of December of, of uh, 2017, we have our mass ply panel facility um, in between our, our current facilities here in Lyons. So at Ferris Lumber, we employ about 430 full-time employees, uh, but we're trying to hire another 50 people if we can, and uh, it's been difficult. We sustainably manage uh, more than 17,000 acres of our own timberland, which um, on a sustained yield basis, or what we grow is what we harvest, produces about 13 to 15% of our total annual usage of uh, timber. We have gross annual sales revenue of about $150 million through a variety of products, such as residual materials like chips, um, hog fuel, uh, bark finds that go to nursery stock, uh, lumber, electricity, plywood, and uh, veneer. And we specialize specifically in veneer for engineered wood products. So this is a view of our uh, mass timber panel facility and how we lay up our, our panels into something that uh, that is qualified under the PRG 320 uh, code for cross laminate timber so it can be used in structural applications across the United States. Uh, 
these are some of the projects that we've been involved in in, in uh, recent periods. Uh, the picture on the left is a five-inch panel that's used as a roof element to a local uh, Chemeketa Community College um, Ag Center that was recently constructed. Uh, the one on the right, uh, top right, is a picture of our panels used as beam, and, beam or columns. And that's one of the unique aspects of our material is that not only is it usable as a flat platform, um, but is also usable as beam and column elements. At this period of time, with, uh, with machining, machinery that we've put in, we can essentially create every single wood element uh, to a multi-story wood structure. Um, this has been a $40 million investment from Ferris Lumber into our local community in order to create these products. And as a lot of people say, we're a little over our skis in that it's not typical for a small family company to have patented and developed a new building product for the market. In recent times, if you've been paying attention to the news, you'll see that uh, there's been a lot of devastation occurring due to wildfires within Washington, Oregon, and California. In particular, the one that's impacted us the most, most is the Beachy Creek Fire, which started as a uh, small burn in the Opal Creek Wilderness area, uh, but due to really high uh, easterly winds uh, has now grown to about 192,000 acres, and this fire is still only 32% contained. The big red, the big black dot on there is um, the location of our facilities. So uh, as you can see, we have been directly impacted. The fires were right up on our property lines. Many of our employees lost their homes and uh, we have been not operating for the last two weeks as we've struggled through poor air quality and uh, the displacement of a lot of our workforce. The, uh, the amount of timber that's burned up on this, this land has been uh, extreme, especially in, in Oregon history. 60% uh, of this is, is generally on federal land. Uh, the rest is on either private industrial landowners. Um, on our own land, we estimate there's about 100 million feet of, of uh, our timber that has been impacted and that we are hoping to salvage in the short term and make use of. This represents about a 15 uh, month supply if that's all we're using or about seven years if it's the same typical um, annual usage for our own timberlands. One of the big things that, that we've been trying to support that we really think would help as far as forest management within, uh, within the Northwest, in the 2018 Farm Bill, our Senator Merkley uh, helped insert a, a section that said that they would allow 20 year uh, long stewardship contracts for uh, innovative producers of mass timber products or innovative uses of wood products. And uh, if we had the opportunity to sign on to a 20 year stewardship contract that provided enough uh, sustainable material through our facilities, then it would give us the opportunity to invest in the longer term, not only in our workforce, but in the rural communities, as well as providing the opportunities for the local workforce to develop uh, harvesters, forwarders, and other type of innovative uh, harvesting techniques in order to thin the entire landscape here across the federal ownership in Oregon. And we, we really believe that veneer uh, manufacturing is one of the best ways to make use of that. Due to the fact that we're peeling veneer off of a log, uh, much like you would a roll of toilet paper, the diameter of the block is less important to us than the quality of the fiber that's included within that log. So the average block size that we use through our small log uh, facility is only nine inches. So we can make use of a lot of that suppressed uh, second growth, third growth understory that um, is the overgrowth and uh, within our forest and the potential fuel for future forest fires. Uh, at our large log facility, our average block diameter is still only 16 inches. So by no means out there looking for a, uh, a large volume of, of big timber. It's just not something that we're interested in processing nowadays. And our two biggest hurdles are timber and labor. Uh, you know, timber number one in that the uh, amount of supply on federal land from federal land has been constrained and we don't have the opportunity to increase operations due to the limitation of the raw material supply in our, in our area. In addition, we are at the end of, uh, of a canyon in which, you know, is bordered by federal land. So we don't have a huge workforce to pull from in order to, um, to uh, provide positions for all of our 430 employees. 
we would like to increase employment, but uh, that, that is definitely a hurdle for us as well. Now, the federal government owns about 60% of the land in Oregon, but they are typically providing less than 15% of the total material harvest in Oregon. Uh, large industrial, large private landowners uh, own about 20% of the state of Oregon forest lands, but they're providing about 63% of the total harvest. Most private, lar large private landowners are tapped out as far as how much fiber they can provide to the mills on a sustained yield basis. So we really need the federal government and the state government to step up and provide additional volume of timber in order to manage our forests and keep the mills operational. And as you can see, there's a real benefit to that as well. As uh, in relation to private land where, where harvest is 70%, 75% of the total grown volume, the mortality is, is dramatically less than you would see on federal land. Where federal land is only harvesting about 9% of its annual growth, the, the amount of mortality on our federal lands is increasing quite a bit. And yet again, that's material that's adding to the overall uh, forest fire danger in Oregon. And this is consistent with what the historical harvest levels are in Oregon. It, prior to the Northwest Forest Plan in the early 90s, uh, we used to harvest about between seven and nine billion board feet of timber. Now in Oregon, we have, uh, we barely harvest four billion board feet. If we're growing considerably more than that, especially over the last 20 to 30 years, that type of volume either has to come out via nature or forest fire, or it can be beneficially harvested for our local rural communities. And this, the chart on, on the right is essentially the same type of indication. As you can see, the large private land, private forest land harvest has been relatively stable over the last 35 years while the amount of uh, volume coming off of our federal lands has dramatically decreased. And this has real, uh, real issues when it comes to employment in our region, as well as to the prosperity in our rural communities. Uh, the forest sector in Oregon contributes about 61,000 living wage jobs at a average wage of $50,000, which is higher than the typical wage in Oregon. Uh, and there's $12.5 billion in annual sales of timber and wood products. So there's a real contribution from the forest sector into the GDP of Oregon. But as you can see, it's been gradually decreasing since, since the 1990s specifically, in which um, we've been embroiled in the spotted owl wars and then the Northwest Forest Plan. And now we've gone from almost 10% of the state GDP to, uh, to only 2%. But when we did have timber harvest prior to uh, the Northwest Forest Plan and the gradual decrease of harvest off the federal land, those timber sale harvests were contributing directly into our rural communities. As you can see on the left-hand chart, uh, prior to the light blue, those were actually uh, dollars contributed to, to the rural communities via the timber sale program. Um, by law and statute of that period of time, any of the timber harvested in the local counties went directly to, to provide the services and to schools and other government services within the county in which they're harvested. Uh, the light blue represents essentially the federal government's attempt to, to make up for the dollars lost from the timber harvest programs uh, via the Secure Rural Schools Act, which is essentially a federal subsidy to our rural uh, counties and uh, communities. And I would argue that it hasn't had that grave an effect on the forest as well. If you take a look at the right-hand chart, you can see that the net growth has gradually increased all the way through the end of uh, the 1990s um, until we stopped harvesting so much. And at that, at this period of time, what we're facing is, is widespread mortality of trees across the, uh, the forest and providing very little economic benefit to our rural communities and very little employment. So the solutions as we see it is the 20 year stewardship contracts is something that, that really needs to happen. It's been signed into law two years ago now but there has been very little to, to no implementation of this program in our local areas by the federal government. Um, and frankly, there's very little guidance on how to get it implemented. But as I said, this, this type of uh, certainty and log supply for the, on, uh, for the future would give us the opportunity to increase our facilities production and also increase our employment. And we would really like to employ our, our rural community directly into managing the forest resources that are, that are included within their regions. And yet again, we need to manage our forests. This, uh, this last forest fire season, over the last couple of weeks, we have burned up 1.2 million acres 
of timberland in Oregon. And that is all uh, trees and resources and uh, habitat and ecological uh, sensitive areas that we feel could have been managed not only for our rural communities, but also better for the environment. And the timber availability is still the single largest uh, hurdle and obstacle that we face as an industry in Oregon to growth. Um, in addition, I, I would say that we also need to encourage locally sourced products. By deciding not to manage the forest within the Northwest, we have also made the decision that we will start importing products from other countries. Right now, uh, for the, uh, we import about 20% of the total U.S. consumption of engineered panel products from South America. And this used to be products that, that were produced in the Northwest when Oregon was the single largest producer of uh, plywood panel products in the world. Um, but that's not the case anymore. We now actually import a large volume from China and from, from Brazil. We would much rather see a forest to frame ethos in which we manage our local forests for construction with our own local markets. And thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Tyler. That was an excellent presentation and um, a very strong finish. Thank you so much for staying with us and being flexible. Um, for those in our audience, just a, this is an opportunity to remind that the briefings that we, our briefings are here, they're now, but they're also are online. And so you can always uh, come back and read a written summary, see Tyler's presentation, same with Jennifer, same with Carter, who we're about to hear from. Uh, and the way to do that is www.esi.org. Um, our briefing archive goes way back. Uh, and covers lots of issues. Um, um, not all as interesting as Mass Timber, but you know, in fairness, they're there too. Um, so thank you so much, Tyler. That was a really good presentation. I really um, appreciated um, all of your comments. Uh, our third speaker, oh, speaking of questions, quick reminder for there. Uh, we're gonna have time for questions and um, there are two ways you can send them and we're already getting a bunch of them, which is great. First is by following us online at EESI online and you can send us questions that way. You can also send us an email www, no, excuse me, that's the website. Email is eesi at eesi.org. And you can, if you, if you have a question for any of our panelists, um, uh, let us know that way. Our third panelist is Carter Sterling. Carter is the CEO of Sterling Solutions, a leading provider of innovative site access solutions for companies that build our nation's energy infrastructure. Carter and his brothers developed TerraLam cross-laminated timber mats as a response to customers who were looking for access mats that offered co consistent quality as opposed to the non-standard kind. Years of research and development combined with the resolve he learned from his parents ultimately led to TerraLam, the innovative, lighter weight, environmentally friendly, cross-laminated timber mat that is transforming site access in the power, oil, gas, and civil construction industries. Carter, thank you for joining us today. Uh, really looking forward to your presentation. Great, thank you, Dan. Uh, as I go through this process of sharing the screen, I would just like to thank uh, Representative uh, Westerman for joining. But you know what I think is really interesting is two of your panelists today, uh, not only are they family businesses, which is incredibly common in the forestry space, uh, but neither of which are right down the middle of the fairway of what Ms. Jennifer Cover was talking about and what you know everybody is thinking about of CLT and mass timber. Uh, you have a family that developed a very unique product in a mass plywood panel that nobody was thinking about. And on this side of the fence, we're utilizing and have been utilizing uh, this great CLT product since 2015 uh, with an industry application nobody's ever thought of uh, for ground protection, temporary roads, and construction sites. Um, and I think that speaks to the fact that, uh, you know, this industry and mass timber yields itself to a tremendous amount of uh, future innovation. Uh, and you know, Jennifer said it perfectly, we're just at the starting line here. Uh, and we're at the starting line of the uh, opportunities that people can see. Uh, we're also at the starting line of all the opportunities people can't even see. And, and again, there's two really interesting examples of it right here. So, um, uh, okay, with that being said, uh, you know, I was asked uh, to come onto this panel and I appreciate the opportunity very much. Uh, I am uh, maybe what you would consider a living and breathing example uh, of what can happen uh, because we started manufacturing CLT panels uh, in uh, Chicago 
of all places uh, in 2000, uh, late 2014. Uh, we kind of kept our head down and stayed quiet about it. Um, and so because we've got a bit of a head start uh, in the United States building CLT, uh, we've come to realize and enjoy, you know, a number of different uh, aspects of this business. Uh, and what we were, you know, talking about today is, is the workforce development. So not only do I get to share what I think we can do, but I can share examples of what we have done. And so uh, that's what I'm going to walk you guys through uh, is, is, is our experience with uh, workforce development. Um, very quickly, I just want you to understand uh, my perspective for my company. We do have a, a vision uh, for our business, and that is to foster harmony between environment and construction, uh, which in and of itself is incredibly challenging. They're typically uh, at odds fighting each other. Uh, and we want to do that with world-class site access solutions. Um, I should pause briefly before I go. Dan, how's my sound? And can you see the screen? Uh, well, your sound is great. Thank you. Um, and uh, I was actually just uh, sending you a chat. Um, you are in presentation mode yeah. uh, as opposed to full screen mode. So fair warning in case you have any. Oh, I've got all, know. I've got all sorts of, uh, of secret social security numbers. Yeah, that's accounts. right. Yeah. But, but otherwise you're sounding great and it's, the slides look fantastic. All right. Well, I'm going to keep going while I try and adjust this at the same time. Um, but our mission statement is, <laughs> is uh, really interesting. Let me see. Well, shoot, if you go back to where you were, I can tell you what to do to uh, put it on normal view. All right, I'm all ears. So just uh, put the slides on um, F5 or what like you that? did before. And, yeah, and then uh, the little three, but three dots uh, below around a circle, click on that and uh, hide presenter. How are we doing now? Um, unfortunately, that's brought us back to. <laughs> Listen, this is this is fine. We can, uh, you can still see the slides in uh, in the editing mode, correct? All right, we're just gonna yes. just uh, enjoy that uh, because that'll get it that'll get it done. You know, our mission, uh, which is our tactical approach to achieving our vision, uh, is such that we want to provide those environmentally favorable uh, access solutions. Uh, most specifically, we're catering to the energy infrastructure space, uh, pipelines, power lines, uh, renewable energy, solar farms, wind farms. Uh, but the important part here is we've always believed that in order to build a sustainable and scalable company that has longevity, we need to be very thoughtful and sincere about allowing the four C's uh, to thrive. And those four C's are, of course, the company and the customer, which everybody thinks about but intensely thinking about colleagues and communities. Um, and again, uh, I guarantee Tyler feels the same way because the forest products industry by and large uh, defaults to this. Forest products companies, typically without even thinking about it, certainly without putting it on paper, are very engaged in their own colleagues, their workforce, uh, and involved in the communities that they're in because they're very rural. Uh, but we've taken this very same mentality and approach from our third generation uh, uh, lumber company and brought it into an urban environment uh, with a very forward thinking technology. So uh, just to level set kind of who we are again, uh, in 2014, we, we started uh, playing with CLT panels. We were about 112 uh, employee organization. Uh, today, we're about a 530 uh, person organization. And we've expanded uh, into two beautiful manufacturing plants, one of which is in the village of Phoenix, Illinois, uh, which is 10 minutes from the boundary lines of Chicago. So it's functionally Chicago. Uh, and the other is Lufkin, Texas, uh, which is about an hour and 45 minutes northeast of Houston uh, in the piney woods of, of East Texas. And the reason that we've chosen these two locations, because when you're going to start a brand new facility, you have the choice. Uh, and of course, you're always gonna look at the economic fundamentals. Uh, what is the proximity to my raw material supply chain? Uh, what is the proximity to my demand? Am I, am I positioning myself close to my customers? Um, and it, the third is that people don't give enough consideration to often, is the workforce. What is the strength 
what are the competitive advantages or disadvantages of a local workforce? And again, uh, Tyler spoke to this. It's a critical piece. And so we, we chose to locate in a economically uh, challenged uh, town of Phoenix, Illinois, in the south suburbs of Chicago, uh, because we believe strongly in that workforce. Um, and you know, the Southland of Chicago, by and large, has been uh, decimated with manufacturing losses. Uh, the steel industry has had a very rough go for the last couple of decades. Uh, unemployment numbers are much higher in the Southland than they are in the uh, urban area of Chicago. And the same situation existed in Lufkin, Texas, which was uh, a robust uh, community full of paper plants, paper mills, uh, and forest products industries that, as you can imagine, over the last decade of emails and anti-paper uh, uh, have been all closed and shuttered. And so the town of Lufkin is just full of wonderful, hardworking people uh, that are uh, well-trained, uh, well-educated, uh, but don't have a place to put their skill set to, to work. Uh, so we planted our flag uh, in, in, in those two areas. Um, and I think that that increase of that uh, 400 employees is evidence of the fact that what we're what we're doing uh, makes sense, right? It works. So what I thought I would share is just a few examples of how we intensify our interaction with those uh, little known two C's, the community and the colleagues. So these are just some uh, sort of real simple pictures and stories of things that we do. Uh, on a regular basis around here. These are not exceptional events. These aren't things that we go out of our way to do. Uh, what's neat is that this is just part of the DNA of our, of our organization at this point. Um, for colleagues, uh, of course, we're developing the uh, skills and uh, uh, habits of our existing workforce, which by and large is a little bit more mature. But community is really interesting. You really have the choice of how to engage in the community um, and we have chosen to engage, you know, at a very youthful level, right? Uh, I, I do believe you can teach many old dogs uh, some new tricks, but I firmly believe that you can teach the vast majority of the puppies uh, almost any trick you want. And what, what our objective is, is to get to the youth of our communities, into our high schools uh, and into our community colleges, and show these young people that there is a wonderful career to be had right here in your backyard, in the Southland, in manufacturing, uh, and in a company that cares greatly about you and, and your families. So, so we spend a lot of time in uh, communicating with the youth uh, that uh, manufacturing is a great place to be. The forest products space is a great place to be. And that you know we are doing something today that didn't exist five years ago. And the same might be said two more years from now or, or five more years from now. We're, uh, in terms of our innovation and our story, we really feel like we're just getting started as well. Um, so these are just images of your very standard sort of high school job fairs. Uh, and then on the right, you can see we're touring uh, kids, uh, young, young adults through our manufacturing plant to give them hands-on exposure to what we're doing. Um, you know, we all, uh, understand this motto and when the employees uh, in a company believe that this is true from wall to wall uh, they bring opportunities to us we don't even have to uh, always bring the opportunities to our employees so so that is something that we firmly believe in uh, really empower people with the knowledge and skills to do it themselves um, part of that uh, is has been developing our own uh, Sterling University. Uh, this is not a, an accredited uh, two-year or four-year college uh, or sophisticated course, but what this is, is again, a focused intentional effort to empower our workforce to gain the skills and knowledge to be incredibly successful, uh, not only for us as an individual company, but as people in general. And, and one example of that is teaching uh, English as a second language courses. Uh, we do that uh, on our own dime when our employees are on the clock being paid hourly, we pull them out 
and we enroll them in English courses. We have a very large, uh, diverse workforce south mm -hmm. of Chicago, a lot of different languages. Of course, a, a predominance of uh, uh, Hispanic and Spanish. Uh, it, it, we see that in Lufkin as well. Um, and you have these wonderful minds and wonderful energetic individuals, but the language barrier stops people dead in their tracks. Uh, and so we've graduated now over the last three years, 185 of our employees through these courses. Um, and, uh, and that gives them the strength and confidence to grow in our business. It also gives them strength and confidence outside our walls. When they leave this business and they can interact with shopkeepers and storekeepers and their banker and all of these people, they're more willing to engage and, and get involved in the community uh, at large. Um, we take a lot of time training our old dogs as well. Uh, they've got a lot of good habits and bad, and, and we know that we can shape that. Um, and so we spend a lot of time empowering these guys and we're teaching them life skills and budgeting skills, uh, and, and things of that nature as well. Um, this story here is just about us taking our workforce and sort of, uh, spreading it like like seeds. I mean, now that we are in Lufkin, Texas, we're bringing our same culture and mentality from up here down there. You know, we're cross-pollinating our workforce so that they can cross-train each other. And, you know, one of the th campaigns that I'm on is uh, a, a renaming of our regions in our country. I mean, as I travel from Chicago down to Texas, the similarities are uncanny. The accent is quite different. Uh, and, and the gun laws are very different. Otherwise, as individual people and characters, it should be the Mid-North and the Mid-South because there is a tremendous connectivity between those two. Uh, mm -hmm. The Midwest, uh, as a nickname, makes no sense to me whatsoever. Um, just another example of how our teams engage. We're always looking after our employees and these are not high dollar costs. These are anything, these aren't things that affect the margins of a business that you, you know, you can't uh, pass through uh, any board of directors or any banker and tell me that these aren't meaningful and important. Uh, and it's all the small things. It's celebrating uh, Halloween. There's an image here in the top right uh, of walking the kids through the office and they're trick or treating from cubicle to cubicle and desk to desk, and I, I, I guarantee if you try that, the adults will love it a lot more than even the kids. It's a wonderful experience. Um, and constantly engaging our employees, whether it's birthdays or anniversaries, uh, of course, the holiday parties, but rewarding them, you know, surprising them on a really hot day with an ice cream truck when, they, when there was no announcement of it, uh, things like that. You know, we recognize that we, all of us spend at least as much time, if not more time at work than we do at home with our families. And, uh, and, and work can be a very enriching experience if we allow it to be. Um, some examples of our community involvement. Uh, and I think this is really neat. All of these examples are community involvement that were employee driven. Uh, you know, there's a number of sort of, uh, examples that I can give off of my desk, but those aren't the ones that are satisfying. The ones that are, are satisfying are the employee driven uh, community connectivity. And th again, a reminder, this is all a ripple effect of being able to grow a company and add a workforce around CLT and mass timber. Without that at the core, we don't get to add employees. We don't get to add this culture and we don't get to impact and affect the communities. You know, uh, a few weeks back, we had this really impressive uh, derecho run through the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And our guys recognized that in our community here in Phoenix, which is a very, very small town, uh, we actually had a tornado touch down and, and the town was decimated. All the trees and foliage were down. Immediately, they came and asked permission. Hey, we've got dump trucks. We've got skid steers. We've got chainsaws. Can we go help? And uh, it was like, wow, absolutely. Let, let's go. Uh, that's the type of community impact that is very hard to document using data, right? And I appreciate data, uh, but those, those are the stories that are hard to tell. Uh, engaged in food drives and clothing drives down in Lufkin, Texas, participating in, uh, you know, uh, Tree City with the town of Lufkin and supporting all of their efforts uh, to get the most out of forestry and doing exactly what Tyler was talking about, which is really uh, smart management of our forests uh, so that we can enjoy the, not the longevity uh, and not be ignorant of the economic prosperity that can come out of it. You know, we recently just partnered with um, 
the NFL and we've done a couple of projects in downtown Chicago in these disadvantaged areas where they want to pop up uh, fresh food uh, markets. Uh, we did one in uh, Bronzeville. We did one in the Austin uh, neighborhood. And the reality is they don't have a strong connectivity to healthy foods, right? Uh, they have you know, terrible options. Uh, the Trader Joe's and the Whole Foods aren't locating themselves in these neighborhoods uh, because that food is typically incredibly expensive. So we've been working to support these pop-up farm stands. And you can see the CLT panels are quite simply the flooring. We can go pop up a farm stand in any park, any corner lot that is looks to be overgrown and, 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 and ridden. We just, we just go out there and push some of that stuff aside, lay down the CLT panels, and you've got a fantastic uh, stable uh, work platform to get your farm stand set up. You can kind of see them in the background there. So uh, we've been very busy with that. Um, just an example again, a final example. This was our grand opening uh, in Lufkin, Texas. Uh, we built our first CLT panel in November of uh, 2019 uh, at our second plant and there in Lufkin. You can see on the shirts, the uh, you know counter is just spinning to number one. And all of our employees got to sign off on uh, on that first panel, and we were we were honored uh, with a visit from Governor Greg Abbott. He came to uh, participate in the ribbon cutting ceremony. He signed our first mat, and just as Representative uh, Westerman is recognizing the tremendous opportunity, uh, Governor Abbott, I don't believe, has visited East Texas uh, in his term. He didn't, uh, I suppose, have a compelling enough reason to, but he came out to East Texas to help us celebrate the grand opening of this CLT plant um, because he also knows the, the, the great impact we can have on the community uh, and, and energize it and revitalize it. Um, so, so that's it. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. And the summary that I just would like to leave folks with is, um, again, my family, my business and company, we've been doing this now for a good five to five and a half years. Um, we are also at the starting line and we've added you know, 400 plus jobs uh, and we've got a lot of families that are really benefiting from CLT and mass timber. Uh, but we definitely have some challenges and, uh, and we definitely need some help. And so I, I've got a, just a ton of respect uh, for, for folks like Dan and this organization, uh, what Jennifer is doing with Woodworks and, uh, and the leadership that Tyler and his family bring to this because it's uh, to be the first of anything is, is really challenging. There's more, I think, pain than there is gain. So. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. That was great, Carter. That was an excellent presentation. I, I really like the uh, the t-shirts with the county. That's that's a cool idea. Um, eventually, those, those numbers will all be nines, and you'll have to buy everybody a, another t-shirt, I suppose. Um, so, so thanks good. so much. And yeah, <laughs> so we're going to go to Q&A now, uh, which is uh, we're looking forward to. And we've got lots of questions coming in. I, I don't know that we're going to get to all of them uh, in the next uh, Ten-ish minutes, but thank you, and we'll uh, we'll do our best to combine as many of them as we can. To kick off Q and A, uh, I am going to introduce my colleague Ellen Bond. Uh, Ellen uh, is our resilience policy advisor here at ESI. Is a fellow uh, Mass Timber acolyte. Uh, I'm new to that world. Ellen's been in it for a while, and she comes from a background in high performance buildings. So, Ellen, I'll turn it over to you for questions, and I'll start going through what we're getting from the audience. Great, thanks Dan, and I know we probably have a lot of questions that people are eager to have asked, so I will, I have a lot too, but I'll just um, start with one, and um, Carter, I wanted just to build off what you were saying, um, all of you um, presented such inspiring stories, um, and Carter, you talked about um, the high school, the outreach to, to the high schools, and uh, you know, the puppies there. <laughs> that are eager for knowledge, which I love. Um, and, and, you know, this is a question I guess uh, Tyler could answer as well, perhaps, but that is, could you talk more about sort of how these, um, how these products are made, um, like the technology, advanced technologies in the manufacturing facility, the skills that, um, that kids, that anybody um, might, need to get to to be able to work in these facilities i think that that might be interesting to some people yeah i think it's a great question and we should probably both answer it as our facilities are are a little bit different and in different areas and so uh, 
but I'd be interested to see if the answers are similar. For me, I've had a, a really neat opportunity again to work with the leaders of our community colleges and high schools, and they do ask those great questions. They say, how can we train our young kids to come into your workforce? And they, they honestly, they never like my answer, and you might not like it either. I would encourage everybody to teach children how to be wonderful parents and develop a strong nuclear family which results in a work ethic. And if I am lucky enough to get individuals that come into my box, as I would refer to it, with a strong work ethic, with a sense of respect for their coworkers and themselves, by and large, I've got the rest. I can train and teach all of my individuals the, uh, uh, the, the skills uh, to run a automated CLT line, the skills to operate the machinery, for shipping and receiving the skills to operate the material handling equipment. Um, uh, all of that is very trainable and doesn't require a extraordinary collegiate, you know, advanced uh, critical thinking and thought process. I think the hardest thing to teach is, is a work ethic. And uh, that really is the core of, of what I need candidly. Great, thank you. Tyler, did you want to add anything to that? Sure, I'd love to add on onto that. And I, I would definitely agree with uh, Carter on that. It, we have several different areas in, in which uh, we try to em employ people. And for the first part, I mean, just just on uh, you know the manual labor piece of things, we need people that will show up on time, that will work hard, and not do drugs. And that's just the, the simple aspect of to it. And what we generally tell people is, make yourself essential. We need you as employers. We need all the employees to show up and, and to work hard and to become a part of this, this family. And we offer all types of, uh, of prog progression through our facilities. And we'll even send people to school in order to learn mill writing, electric, electrical trades and whatnot. Um, when it comes to the mass timber manufacturing, since we're a little bit more on the structural side of things, yeah, we've really had to start hiring some educated people that understand uh, construction engineering. Uh, we've got two sales engineers on staff now. We've got several BIM modelers and CAD, uh, CAD modelers so that we could uh, start integrating the building designs that are coming from the engineers and the architects into something that's usable from a manufacturing standpoint. And we've got a uh, 12 foot CNC bridge that, you know, allows us to fabricate these panels in the specific formats that the, uh, that the customers are looking for. Um, in addition to that, we need skilled carpentry trades that, that uh, can process the final panels so they're in a format that our end customers need. So we definitely need a little bit more skilled trades through our facilities if we're pr producing structural wood elements that could go into buildings at up to 18 stories. Great. Thank you so much. I love it. The mix of the old and the new skills. Thank you. Great. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to ask you a question from our audience, but I would also like to make sure that Tyler and Carter feel like they can participate as well. And if you have any comments. Uh, and the question is a little bit more of a clarification. Uh, and I'm trying to combine a couple to get the most in. The question is premised on the idea that trees sequester carbon when they're alive. The question is whether or not trees continue to sequester carbon after they're cut down and sort of what the relationship between mass timber is to carbon sequestration and what other potential environmental benefits we might see like maybe less uh, uh, transportation west to the closer together supply chains, uh, energy efficiency, insulation qualities, um, properties that maybe the lamination provides or veneers or whatever it happens to be. So Jennifer, I'd like to hear what you have to say and then Carter and Tyler, please feel free to weigh in too. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Thank you. So in terms of sequestering carbon, as a tree grows, it's pulling like a giant sponge carbon out of the atmosphere um, and it locks it away into the actual structure of the tree. And so once that tree is cut, it stops pulling carbon in, but now it's been locked into there kind of um, to what Representative Westerman was referring to as far as becoming a carbon sink. So now that that tree has the carbon locked in and as it goes through the life of then being you know, manufactured into a material that we used in a building, 
example, the building that's that's being shown behind me, um, that will keep that carbon locked in there for the life of the building and even longer if it then gets reused afterwards. So um, it's an amazing way of basically pulling carbon out of the air, storing it, locking it away and keeping it in a building. So it will not be released unless that burns down. So um, one of the benefits overall to the environment is that with mass timber in particular, you can use smaller diameter trees. So we are looking at trees that are younger um, and potentially that are hazardous fuel undergrowth type materials that can cause problems in our forests. Um, and a lot of the points that Tyler was making about proper forest management, being able to thin these these areas and utilize that material um, in a product that then can be used to build a structure. So it's pretty amazing, a win-win solution we have here to be able to go in, sustainably manage a forest, pull out that material and have a high value end use uh, product that can be made from that material helps that pull through of really making sure that we continue to do that. So that's a huge benefit from a forest service perspective in terms of managing the forests and keeping them healthy. And you can also use alternative species that maybe don't have a home currently in other construction and uses can be bundled up into a lot of these mass timber products. So I don't know, Tyler or Carter, you want to add to that? Well, you know, from a forest management standpoint, I, I would definitely say that, you know, trees add more carbon through the younger growing cycle. That, that's not to say that we, we shouldn't have a mosaic of multiple age classes across our entire forest landscape. We absolutely need to. But the way that, that Oregon and Northwest and really nationwide uh, lumber and veneer and panel manufacturers are now, we don't take big logs. We don't look for big logs. We're looking to try and manage these forests from an understory standpoint and to, uh, to assist with the forest management on the longer term. Thanks. Ellen, we'll go back to you. Okay, great. Uh, so um, I guess just following up on that, do you also, can you also use disease trees, dying trees, insect, uh, damaged trees. Yeah, Tyler, Carter, you want to take that, or you want me to? So I, I'll jump in from the perspective of you know the application that we are using our CLT panels for, which are again these temporary roads and, and construction platforms to to protect our soil and uh, and not rut it up. We we do have the option of using almost anything. We don't have the structural strength requirements of putting in the floor of, of the 13th story or the walls of the 17th story. And so, yeah, we can use uh, almost any species uh, and almost any grade, uh, as long as we do it in a, in, in a, uh, a common sense manner. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we, we can be very opportunistic uh, as, the needs, as the needs arise. And to Thanks. Carter's point, yes, at some period of time, the uh, after a tree has died or if it's diseased or has bugs, it will affect the design characteristics of that fiber itself, and we will not be able to use it. That said, if we look at the, the fires that have occurred in our region, we believe that we should be able to use most of the fiber if we're, we can salvage log and make use of it within the next 12 months or so. Thank you. That's interesting. Um, I'm going to ask maybe if we just hang on for a couple extra minutes. I know we had a little bit of a hiccup there in the beginning and um, there is a couple, there are a couple questions that have come in on uh, another topic that is near and dear to me and also near and dear to Ellen and that is building codes. And the question is um, two, two part. What is, what is the role of the building code uh, in your industry's growth potential? Um, and the second is, are building codes updated enough to sort of drive um, market expansion to where you know you think your your industry can go? And I know you are all coming from different parts of the country, and different building codes look different in different parts of the country. Um, so Jennifer, maybe we'll start with you. If you have any thoughts on that, and then Tyler and Carter, based on where you're operating and where your products are used, interested in what you sort of have to think about the role of codes, and then we'll 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 end there. Yeah, for sure. So the roller codes are huge in terms of the market growth. So they really are what open the doors for architects and engineers to be able to design buildings. It gives them the guidelines to make sure that there is a comprehensive set of safety standards in place. Uh, with the adoption of the 2021 um, 
International Building Code, that is where we will seek guidance on how to design up to 18 stories. A lot of jurisdictions are already pre-adopting this in their regions. So um, if you're interested in information as to what your local jurisdiction is doing, feel free to reach out and I'm, I can definitely share what's happening throughout the entire US. Um, I think one thing to advocate for is newest codes in your, in your state. It's really important that you have adopted what is um, the most advanced codes um, in your region, just from a safety perspective, as well as if you want to see some of these new opportunities incorporated into your areas of the country. Um, so it's, they're, they're critically important. It's really important to move them forward and have the most current version adopted regionally. Yeah, I, I concur and I can tell you, I, so my business here in the uh, mid north is in Cook County and Cook County is a challenging environment to say the least. Uh, and what they are not looking to do is advance, you know, uh, innovation and in building codes. They're looking to uh, take the path that uh, creates the least amount of risk and supports uh, sort of some old, old habits. Um, I've enjoyed working with the Chicago Carpenters, Jennifer, as, as you have, and we've supplied them with their panels. And uh, uh, really impressed at what they're doing. And I think for, for me here in the mid north and, and uh, they're going to be play a very, very impactful role. They have a loud voice. They've got a lot of respect. And if uh, the if the leadership of Cook County sees that these individuals and these unions really want to promote this and they're gearing up and they're becoming a leader in the entire country uh, to do it, that, that's going to help a lot. But right now, there's uh, there's no indication that our local leadership from the state or the or the county has any indication of of adopting these things, and then that requires developers to go out on a limb and, and uh, request a variance. And that, you know, you touched on that too. That's uh, that's very risky, and you've got to have a real severe motivation to do something. So, uh, it's a it's a big deal. Yeah, I would add, uh, we've really got to give a lot of thanks to Woodworks as well as the American Wood Council for actually being as proactive as they have and doing the really heavy lifting in order to try and get these building codes uh, approved under the 2021 IBC. Uh, we're, part, we're very lucky on the West Coast in that almost all the West Coast states, Washington, Oregon, and California, have approved a special alternate path towards pre-approval under the, the new building codes. So I think uh, if you remember Jennifer's uh, chart, there is a lot of mass timber construction that's being looked at and in process on the West Coast. And that's partly due to the fact that they've been very progressive in adopting those codes. Great, thanks. Uh, Tyler, that will be the last word of today. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Jennifer, uh, Carter, and Tyler, thanks uh, for an excellent set of presentations. Apologies for the hiccup there in the middle, but um, uh, we'll figure out a way to um, to fill in uh, anything that, that might have been missing, and certainly there'll be written materials and follow-up. Um, let me close out with a few quick things. The first is to thank Ellen uh, for all the work uh, in the policy team leading up to Workforce Wednesdays. Uh, let me also, oh, I just, I don't know what's going on with Zoom today. I keep going to full screen, I get kicked off. I don't know, I, I don't know what the issue is. Let me also thank uh, some of our intrepid interns, uh, including Emma, Karen, Hamilton, and Joseph. They're helping out behind the scenes. Uh, Emma, in fact, wrote a web article about this very topic that got posted yesterday. So if you haven't uh, read it yet, um, you should visit EESI.org. Uh, you should sign up for our newsletter. Uh, it's a really good article, and so hopefully you'll like it. Uh, and then also, of course, let me thank Omri and Dan O'Brien uh, and uh, everyone else who made today possible. Um, this slide uh, has a link for a survey. If you have a moment, uh, we would love to hear about sort of what you thought about the topic today, um, how we might do better in the future. We really, it matters a lot to us to, for you to take a few moments to fill out that survey. We read every response and we, we do our best. So if you'd be willing to do that, it'd be much appreciated. Um, one bit of housekeeping, you might remember that last week I mentioned a bonus briefing presented in partnership with the Just Transition Fund that was scheduled for this Friday, the 25th. Um, we're going to postpone that, um, and so keep an eye out for an update. That issue is going to be a very important topic for us going forward, um, but we're not going to do that on Friday. Uh, we will, however, have uh, the final installment of Workforce Wednesdays next Wednesday, where we'll be uh, learning about low-carbon small business and post-COVID-19 recovery. Uh, going to be a great panel once again. And um, you've heard it from me before, the best way to stay involved or to stay up to date 
uh, with ESI and all of our briefings is to visit us online and to sign up for our Climate Change Solutions newsletter, which comes out every other Tuesday. I think we'll go ahead and end it there. Thanks for sticking with us a few extra minutes past 1.15. Uh, thanks again to Jennifer, Tyler, and um, um, where did my thing go? Carter, sorry. Um, I don't know. I, some, I, maybe it's a full moon. Uh, sorry about that. Thank you for your wonderful presentations. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks to our audience and hope everyone has a great rest of your Wednesday.